Welcome to season three of Creative Solutions for a New World Climate and Artist Series. I'm Frances Littman, your host, and I'd like to gratefully acknowledge the Coast Salish people of this region and First Nations worldwide. For thousands of years, the abundance that these lands and waters provide us to live, work, and play is due to the reciprocal relationships by which Coast Salish and the world's first people have lived and live today. We have an incredibly full program today, and we will endeavor to answer your questions live before the conclusion of today's show. If we run out of time, we will get answers to your questions and post them with the video replay early next week. So right now, let's take a moment to imagine what a carbon neutral city in 2050 may look like. Instead of driveways and garages for parked cars, perhaps there would be food gardens and affordable, eco-friendly and energy and efficient infill housing. Boulevards would be brimming with fruit trees, community gardens and areas for people to enjoy. Plus tiny eco-homes and gardens would now form communities where parking lots and cars used to take up vast areas of parking space. And pedestrians, cyclists and electric wheeled devices would move people around safely and effortlessly throughout the city. Now imagine the convenience of an integrated driverless transit system picking you up and taking you home in a fully electric vehicle with the option of a nearby electric share vehicle also readily available. The air would be clear, fresh and free from smelly carbon emissions. And the only sounds would be the rustling of leaves from the trees, birdsong and people laughing and enjoying life. Consumption of products would be greatly reduced as we would practice a circular economy and repurpose, reuse and compost everything possible. There would no longer be 300 million tons of plastic waste in Canada and 15 billion plastic bags or garbage is overflowing with billions of takeout coffee cups and face masks. There would essentially be no waste and healthier people everywhere. Packaging, when required, would no longer be made of plastic, but of biodegradable, non-toxic products, like this laundry strip. This is the way of the future, not this. And manufacturers would be held accountable for the entire life cycle of their products and packaging with polluter pay fines strictly enforced and pollution and waste now socially unacceptable. Everyone would carry their own reusable lightweight cup, plate and cutlery as part of the new culture and clean drinking water would be readily available in public places. Delicious locally grown and produced organic fresh food and products would be abundant with farmers and creators earning livable incomes and zero waste stores like the Zero Waste Emporium on Douglas Street in Victoria would be the norm. All organic material would be composted and used in regenerative agriculture where soil is a massive carbon sink. If there was some residual waste, it would thermally be treated in a renewable fuel to heat buildings along with affordable solar. Landfills would be a thing of the past. They would be reclaimed to become carbon sinks, complete with biodiverse forests growing on top of them once again as landfill expansion would no longer be necessary. The regional district of Nanaimo has a zero waste plan and we will learn today how are they making this a reality. Now, Jonathan Reardon, our Climate in the Arts partner and a former Deputy Minister for the Environment, will introduce some of our guests today. Welcome, Jonathan. Thank you, Francis. That uh, vision that you so eloquently expressed can only come about by a genuine connection between community groups and local government the politicians. This transition is not happening fast enough. So we're in Creatively United are looking at featuring today a number of community members who are pushing the envelopes to make creative solutions happen. Nature knows no waste. Everything is recycled or reused. And Creatively United has walked this talk by holding a number of Earth Day events over the last eight years where they have had no waste as a result of these events. Now I'd like to introduce Larry Gardner, who is the manager for solid waste in the regional district of Nanaimo. So the regional district of Nanaimo is located about 100 kilometers north of Victoria on the east coast of Vancouver Island. It's a population of around 150,000 centered in the community of Nanaimo. And Larry has been working in the last few years on a very innovative uh, solid waste plan moving towards zero waste. So Larry, what does zero waste mean? in your Nanaimo Solid Waste Plan? 
Um, thank you, John. I pre really appreciate the opportunity to participate in this panel. For zero waste, the regional districts adopted um, the Zero Waste Alliance definition of zero waste, and it's really about promoting highest and best use. And essentially, it, the idea is to keep end of life materials out of landfill or incinerators. Good. And are you reasonably confident that you can achieve uh, zero waste? You've got a time frame of 2027. And you're on the way there, but you think you're going to get there because you'll be probably the first jurisdiction in North America that gets to that target. Well, we are on the we are on the path to zero waste, and right now our target is a 90% waste diversion. Um, I do believe there will be a long-term need for residuals um, into the future or into the foreseeable future. Um, but will we meet that 90 90% diversion? Um, I don't actually, I think that'll be very challenging to do within the 10 year term of the plan, but I, but I do believe over the next generation, over the next 20 or 30 years, um, we will actually get there. Well, Larry, um, can I just follow up? Because you've got two really innovative solutions. One is a new set of source separation bylaws for the regional district, and the other is a way of um, managing the private waste haulers so that they're encouraged to divert rather than dump in the landfill. Can you talk about these two solutions? Uh, I'd be happy to. So our, our solid waste management plan that was approved by the minister last year has, you know, a number of the um, zero waste initiatives and in education and promotion and a number of activities to increase uh, waste diversion. But the two innovative pieces are what you mentioned, mandatory source separation and the waste hauler licensing. The mandatory source separation, it's essentially it will be a requirement that every business multifamily uh, facility has three separate bins, one for garbage, organics, and right recycling. It's essentially what we've had in place for the last decade with our uh, single family dwellings, um, where we provide collection and we have a three bin service and a very high level of participation. So it's essentially transferring that to the multifamily sector and, and businesses. We don't actually plan to police the use of them, um, but we're pretty optimistic that we're gonna get very high levels of participation because once they have the service, people will begin to use it and um, will create social norms. Um, we also plan to provide an option where, um, you know, essentially if somebody doesn't have room for bins, they could retain a company to do post collection sorting. For us to do this, though, we do need a dedicated regulation from the province that will give us the authority to introduce that requirement. Then secondly, the waste hauler licensing, and this is a little bit more complicated and it's not quite as intuitive how it drives diversion, but the objective is to promote the flow of waste to the waste industry. And the reason we want to do that is because the waste industry is actually very good at waste diversion, but further we want to send them to put efforts into diversion versus disposal. Um, so in order to do that, our plan is to give the waste industry a lower tipping fee. So they have a price advantage so they can offer a lower price to the customers, waste starts to flow to industry. Um, to do that, we'd like to license haulers. So it would be the license haulers that would get that advantage. So if, all we, if we stop there, we would just um, waste would go to the waste haulers and we would just receive larger loads of waste from industry. So we also want to introduce a uh, disposal levy that would only apply to the disposal of, of end of life materials. So, um, and that's whether it's a landfill or an incinerator and whether that's in Nanaimo or any other jurisdiction. Essentially the purpose of the levy is to eliminate the search for low cost disposal and have the industry focus on diversion. If they can divert the materials, they won't pay the levy to the to the regional district. So that's um, that's how we're hoping to change the behavior of the industry to focus on diversion versus disposal. The uh, and for us to do this as well, we need approval from the province to allow us to license the waste industry. So what we're trying to develop is a systems approach with the mandatory source separation and the waste hauler licensing. So the waste generators are putting effort into source separation and helping the waste industry be successful. The waste industry is now 
disposed, so that's where they're focusing their energy. By providing the industry a price advantage, we grow the waste industry. Um, we also leverage the whole waste industry to provide service for the community rather than just, you know, a few single or a very few government provided services. So we grow the industry around more and better services. We get more convenience as, uh, as consumers or um, for managing our land to life products. Um, and we actually improve the economy by, by growing the industry as well. That's how we're looking to change the behavior grow the economy, do good things for the environment. And that's the innovation of the plan. Thanks a lot, Larry. That's a wonderful innovation. And it's going to be interesting to see whether it can be transferred to the capital regional district, which is the other regional district we're now going to talk about in terms of waste management planning. Just uh, so our viewers understand, in British Columbia, the responsibility for managing solid waste lies with regional districts, which is a form of local government. But the plans have to be approved by the BC Ministry of Environment before they can be implemented by the regional district. So the plans that Larry is talking about are those created by the regional district, submitted to the minister for his, his approval, and if approved, then they're implemented by the regional district. And in the capital regional district, we also have a solid waste management pro process, but it's uh, not nearly as ambitious as the uh, process we've outlined in Nanaimo regional district. I'm now going to introduce by video Hugh Stevens, who is the director of the Mount Work Coalition, which is a local community group which is pressing for a much more aggressive target for solid waste and um, zero waste in the Capital Regional District. So Hugh, let's talk first about the Mount Work Coalition and what is its mission and how is it working on zero waste? The Mount Work Coalition is a group of uh, citizens from across the region that uh, came together last year to uh, uh, because of concerns about what is happening to the general Mount Work Park and Mount Work area because of the CRD's current plans to expand the landfill. So our mission is to support the protection of Mount Work and responsible stewardship for the area and to work with the CRD and, uh, and, and Saanich Council and the province to make uh, responsible management decisions. The Mount Work area is uh, an important recreational spot for people in the region. Durance Lake is a very popular swimming area. A lot of mountain bikers use it. And the current solid waste management plan is premised on the basis that uh, uh, to extend the life of the landfill, it will need to be expanded. This expansion will remove 73 acres that are currently used by mountain bikers. It will require blasting and quarrying and uh, basically ensure that we continue to pile more waste into the landfill, creating methane, uh, you know, for decades to come. We think this is not the right way to go, that uh, by adopting more aggressive zero waste uh, policies, we can keep the landfill going by reducing what goes into it rather than by making a bigger hole. At the beginning of the show, Francis talked about food waste and the need for us all to reduce the amount of waste in the food we consume. So what is the proportion of organics going into the landfill and what other aspects, what, how, how much more can we actually have zero waste in Heartland compared to what we've heard from Nanaimo? You know, there's been a ban on uh, food scraps since 2015, yet over 20% of what goes into the landfill today is organics, food scraps, uh, garden waste, and so forth. Another 15% is papers and fiber products, 17% is wood products, uh, plastics, is another 14%. In fact, more than half of what goes into the landfill today comes from uh, industrial, institutional, and commercial users. So if we are going to preserve the landfill and reduce our waste, we have to focus on these, on these uh, heavy users as well as individual consumers. Now, the current plan is to get the per capita uh, consumption of waste um, on an annual basis down from about 380 kilos per year to 250. Now that's, that's extending it across all the region. That includes all the heavy industrial uses as well. That would be a one third reduction. And that's what's in the current plan, which has some interesting initiatives, but that will lead inevitably to expansion of Heartland. In fact, it's premised, if we get down to 250 kilos per person, we will then need to expand Heartland landfill and we will start doing so in 2030. 
what we should be going for is a much uh, deeper reduction. And in fact, this was proposed by the Solid Waste Advisory Council, a two thirds reduction down to 125 kilos per person. Unfortunately, it was rejected by the CRD board on the basis they'd have to go back and redo the plan and so forth. So they would adopt it as an aspirational target, which means it's nice to have, but we don't actually plan on doing anything to achieve it. There's no funding, there's no concrete action plan. The current plan is based on a one third reduction. We can do far better than that. We should be following the example of the Nanaimo and some other districts which are adopting much more aggressive reduction plans along the lines of Victoria's uh, Zero Waste Initiative, the One Planet Sanish proposal, the very interesting waste to energy uh, innovative technologies that are being looked at by Esquimalt, all these would lead to a significant reduction, much, much deeper reduction than what is currently being proposed. So here we are, a region that's, prof that's professed uh, a climate emergency, has set a goal of being carbon neutral by 2020, 2050. It's a one planet Saanich uh, region with a commitment to a 75% reduction in the way we consume products. It's got uh, a uh, concern uh, or a target for zero waste and a circular economy, yet from what you're telling me, it's not quite doing the job. So the role of your group is to gather allies and push the CRD further than they're doing. So tell us a bit about how you're doing that. What is your petition and how are you engaging the community? We have a website which has a lot of key messaging on it. Uh, that is the mountworkcoalition.org backslash stop CRD. This leads you to a lead now petition, which uh, we hope our regional directors will listen to. It also provides information for public feedback to the current solid waste management plan. That consultation period has been extended now to the 15th of February. Uh, the consultation is all online because of COVID. So it really frankly has not got out into the community very much, but the information on the plan is up on the website. There's a feedback form. Uh, but it's hard to digest. It's, a, it's a, something like a 200 page document. And so our website actually provides, I think, some very useful information as to how the public can provide feedback. And it also provides links to all the CRD directors. I think they need to hear from the public that what is being proposed now is just not good enough. That they have declared a climate emergency, that's good. Awareness is an important part of that. But now is the time to put some beef into the hamburger and to come up with some concrete plans to move beyond these rather unambitious targets and to move to something that will really move the needle in terms of making a commitment in this area to zero waste, uh, to meeting the declarations of a climate emergency and getting us down to a carbon neutral future. It depends on everybody. We all have to do our part, uh, but we all have a part to play also in reaching our political leaders and getting the message through to them that we want to see some leadership, we want to see some action, and that Victoria, the greater Victoria area can do better. Well, thank you, Hugh. There you are. The summary is that we all can do better. We need to do better. And we need community groups to spur both ourselves as citizens and our politicians to reach these aspirational goals. Thank you very much, Hugh, for your insights. You're welcome, John. And thanks for your support. Well said. Thank you for your leadership, Jonathan and Hugh and Larry. Let's take a moment now to do a short poll about food waste. First question. Approximately what percentage of food produced in Canada is wasted each year? Is it 21%, 82%, or 58%? The percentage of food produced in Canada that is wasted each year is 58%. Second question. How much money does the average household spend on food that ends up being thrown away each year? Is it $2,500, $560, or $1,100? The correct answer is $1,100. The third question. How much food is wasted per person in Canada per year? Is it 63 kilograms or 139 pounds, 220 kilograms or 485 pounds, or 510 kilograms or 1,124 pounds? The amount of food wasted per person in Canada each year is 510 kilograms or 1,124 pounds. Fourth question, approximately, how much does food waste cost Canada's economy each year? Is it 2.5 billion, 7.3 billion, or 14 billion? The correct answer is 14 billion in food waste costs. Final question. 
Organics wasted in a landfill produce methane gas, which is how many more times damaging to the environment than carbon dioxide? Is it 25 times, nine times, or 63 times? The correct answer is 25 times. There are many ways to prevent food waste. Here are just a few examples. Shop fresh at local farmer's markets. Plan meals and make a grocery list. Store fruits and vegetables properly so they can last longer. Get creative with leftovers. Use them in all kinds of amazing ways. And think about expiry dates. You can push it a bit. If we all do our part, we can make a difference. Now I'd like to introduce Vancouver-based international award-winning poet, writer, and zero-waste advocate, Fiona Teenwai. Fiona was born in Scotland and came to Canada as a child. She received her law degree at Queen's University in Kingston and the University of Toronto, but she left law to pursue a master's degree in creative writing at UBC and now teaches at Simon Fraser University. Fiona's work has appeared in more than 35 anthologies, including the best Canadian poetry in English, both 2010 and 2020, and Force Field, 77 Women Poets of BC. Her award-winning poetry videos have screened at festivals locally and internationally. Her third collection of poetry, Odes and Laments, <laughs> celebrates the overlooked wonder and beauty in the everyday while lamenting harm to the ecosystems. She won the New Quarterly's Nick Blanchford Prize and was a finalist for the City of Vancouver Book Award. We have a short one minute video to show you what uh, failure, that Fiona created, wrote and produced called Plastic Nick. And we'll hear from Fiona about how this piece came to be after we view it now. Plastic Nick. Open plastic hampers. Pop open plastic lids to plastic clamshells a convenient feast huddled within. Sit on plastic chairs around plastic tables draped with plastic. Use plastic spoons to heap food on plastic plates. Devour it with plastic forks and knives. Pour soda from plastic bottles into plastic cups and suck it up with plastic straws while the baby suckles on a plastic soother. Later, wrap all leftovers in new plastic or scrape them into old plastic. Carry it all home in plastic. Then take plastic out of plastic to put on plastic shelves in the plastic body of the fridge. Welcome, Fiona. Are you there? Yes, there it's a pleasure are. to be here. Thanks so much, Francis. Oh, thank you for coming. Tell us what inspired you to make this film and become a zero waste advocate. Well, it was actually, um, I saw the Clean Bin Project documentary back in 2011. It's a fabulous, fabulous, funny documentary made in Canada about a couple who try to compete about who can make the less, least amount of waste. I won't give away a uh, spoiler alert. I won't uh, tell you about who won. But anyways, uh, it was a great movie and I was already recycling and trying my best, but that gave me a challenge to become zero waste myself. And I really struggled because there's plastic in everything, going grocery shopping and so forth to find the means to be zero waste. I tried writing about it too. And that was a struggle because it came out just as kind of a rant, which is a bit of a turnoff for, for audiences. They don't want you proselytizing and preaching at them. So I was trying to think of a way that would reach people with humor and truth and reach kids as well as teens and people of all generations and all cultures. And because I'd already used video poetry in the past, I thought this would be a great means to do so. So I'd already written some um, poems in the concrete style. Some people might know here in the audience, concrete poetry, it looks, it's shaped in a certain way. So I had written some poems that were shaped uh, on the page, but I thought, you know, very few people are picking up the poetry books and reading them. And yeah, I can teach it in schools and so forth, but I wanted to reach out further. And so I teamed up with an animation um, graduate from Emily Carr University of Art and Design, who was very talented. She's an award-winning um, South Asian um, Canadian. 
And she agreed to work with me because usually animators end up working in these big projects and they don't get things of their own. So they, she was eager to work with me. And I loved her use of color and mandalas. So uh, I told her, I saw sort of this idea of a, a plastic plate and then this mandala, instead of you know beautiful colors and, and objects and so forth, the things that I've seen, every time I go on a picnic, I merged picnic with plastic to make plasticnic because that's what our many picnics are. You see people outside enjoying the great outdoors, the environment, campsites and so forth. And then you see the garbage cans or the picnic tables littered with garbage, just overflowing with garbage. Totally unnecessary, totally unnecessary. So I thought I'd sort of do a spoof on that and have this mandala of accumulation of all this plastic from the cups and to the straws and the water bottles and the containers and the takeout containers, the styrofoam and everything accumulate. And I thought, you know, it's also in our fridge. Our fridges, of course, are made of plastic too. Um, and, uh, and to show some scenes afterwards of the waste that uh, uh, Larry and, and other people uh, have to, and Hugh were talking about the waste that accumulates and how to deal with it. But I think we need to start by looking at ourselves and at the corporations that are packaging everything in plastic and, and then giving us this, leaving us in the state of confusion about where to put everything. Mm -hmm. So- You mentioned the six R's. I, when yeah. we, you and I had talked, I know you're an advocate of those. Yes, the six R's. Now we know the three R's from you know reading, writing and arithmetic, but this is something I think we all need in our minds is the six R's. And the last one is recycle. First, we need to rethink, do we need this item? Is there another way to buy it? Can we go and buy it in a bulk store or in a zero waste store? Do we even, do we need to take it out even? Can we eat in? We can refuse to buy that item in that packaging. We can say, no, I would like this in brown paper instead of plastic, please. Or don't put that in the plastic bag. We can reduce our consumption. We can reuse things. A lot of containers we can reuse rather than having single waste plastics litter um, our streets and fill our landfills. We can repair things. A lot of clothing is made with polyester and fleece and all kinds of other nylon fabrics. Can we repair these things or somehow do something else with those um, fabrics like a quilt, um, anything else? And then the last thing we should be doing um, after we do all these five other things is to recycle. Only nine to 10% of plastic actually gets recycled. And when you think of the whole cycle, People think, well, how is plastic related to climate change and the climate crisis? Well, of course, plastic, as the experts know here on the panel, is, is made out of petroleum. Plastic's made out of petroleum. First, there's the extraction of it, of the petroleum products. There's the transportation, which risks oil spills. Then there's the incredibly carbon dioxide producing processing of that petroleum into different products that um, become part of plastic um, with uh, naphtha and gasoline becoming ethylene and styrene and so forth. So there's all this heating process and this distillation, polymerization, creating this, all these greenhouse gas emissions. Then it comes to us. Then we end up either uh, throwing it out, which goes into the landfill, or it becomes incinerated, more greenhouse gas emissions, or you send it to recycling, which involves more transportation and CO2, which then leads to the heating and reformulation of that uh, recycled plastic into other plastic items, which is more CO2. So plastic is not the answer. If we can avoid plastic, we should do it in every way. And there's so many resources available um, that, that can assist us with that. Solutions exist, that's for yeah. certain. And thank you for all the links you provided. We put them in the chat. And when we do the video replay, we'll include those. And there's some great films. And I have to say, I love the Clean Bin Project. And we showed that at Creatively United at our second festival. And oh, it was just so well received. So thank you, Fiona, for joining us. And now I'm going to go back to John to introduce our next guest. Thank you so much, Fiona. Thank you again, Francis. So I uh, well, want to welcome Kim Fowler. Kim is the um, sustainability planner for the regional district of Nanaimo, which we talked about earlier on zero waste. And she's also been a planner with the city of Victoria in, in uh, earlier in her career. But she's a very uh, creative planner. She's looking for sustainable solutions and innovative solutions. 
she's currently working on some plans in the Nanaimo Regional District to the year 2032 to deal with uh, carbon neutrality. So Kim, can you um, talk about what you're planning in the Nanaimo Regional District and what innovations are you looking for? Hi, John. Um, thanks for inviting me. We've essentially have two uh, projects within the uh, Regional District of Nanaimo's uh, corporate strategic plan from 2019 to 2022. And the first one is to create a climate action technical advisory committee to come up with mitigation and adaptation actions immediate strategy uh, to address those. And the second one with uh, under the climate change is also to update the 2007, actually replace the 2007 corporate energy and emissions plan with the goal to be carbon neutral by 2032. So those are the two uh, main uh, actions that we're currently working on. I can give you some more information um, on that if you'd like. Actually, it would be useful to give us some of the strategies that you think are going to get you to carbon neutrality. Yeah, well, well essentially, yeah, corporately, so I said this one is corporate, uh, for the corporate carbon 2032 neutral plan, it essentially is looking at operations. And as we've already noted, the landfill that the RDN operates is by far the largest emitter, mostly because it, it emits methane. So, and uh, my colleague Larry has talked about how to reduce that, but it uh, by far is the largest emitter corporately. The next uh, items that are uh, emit greenhouse gases are uh, vehicles and buildings. And so essentially there's a process to go through uh, to add things, fuel switch uh, if we can, get away from fossil fuels, get to biofuels. One of the challenges with that on Vancouver Island, believe it or not, is we don't have a biofuel provider. So we want to switch and we actually can't get the biofuels to do that. And those are diesel vehicles, even, you know, I said we do electrify the fleet, so we do have electric vehicles, but being able to do a fuel switch, so there's a very big business opportunity uh, to be able to do that. But we will also do heat pumps um, and those other actions and needing to put in the corporate structures to be able to achieve that. And that is both their budget um, as well as things like business cases, climate lenses, social equity lens we're also working on, uh, but essentially those triple bottom line measures that change from all I care about is the sticker cost. All I care about is how much that truck's gonna cost or how much the new building will cost when we know that when you own and operate a, a piece of infrastructure, whether it's a car or a building, 60% and sometimes up to 80% of the cost over the life of that infrastructure is your operations and maintenance. So there's your business case to reduce your greenhouse gases and improve your efficiency. For the uh, Climate Action Technical Advisory Committee, that's a really interesting group where we've said that's the public uh, consultation involvement that we've chosen for this. These are a group of technical experts. Um, they're engineers, planners, uh, hydrogeologists, and they are advising us uh, corporately on how and, and from a community perspective on how to reduce greenhouse gases, both in mitigation and adaptation. And the big difference for us is like, un unlike many plans, which take several years, uh, or even if they take a year, they come up with 50 suggestions and 200 or 200 ideas, uh, that is not very helpful. We know what most of those options are out there that are available. We only have the capacity to do you know, maybe four to eight of them at the moment. And this is where we're, we're getting down to the very hard work of making choices on what we think should be recommended for the region to be actually, uh, address greenhouse gas reductions. So it sounds as though you've got a good harmony between your work, uh, the, the advisory task group is giving you good advice and the politicians who are willing to make some decisions. So we have um, unity here. So let's talk a little bit about uh, an innovative project that you helped create in, uh, when you were with the city of Victoria and that's the Dockside Green Development on the Inner Harbour. So maybe you can explain why that was so innovative of its time, but it's about uh, 10 or 15 years ago that it was developed and what uh, opportunities there are to create more of these kinds of developments going to the future. Yes, thank you, John. And I'm going to screen share um, so that you can actually see some of the pictures. So this is the site actually taken from the Bay Street Bridge in August of 2019. Why is it different than anything else? And, and essentially I've written a book that covers the 18 year history that I've had with this project. I was the initial project manager back in 2001, uh, where the uh, site was on the top 10 contaminated sites uh, of, in British Columbia, which you're familiar with, John. 
uh, and it uh, was nicknamed Dark Side because it was so contaminated they couldn't sell uh, the property. And so we changed the, the system and the process uh, and made a sandbox of, of innovation and regulations uh, that, uh, that enabled a sustainable developer to come and partner with the city of Victoria because we owned the land at the time uh, to build, uh, design and build the most sustainable development in the world under the leadership through energy and environmental design, the LEED system. So in 2008 and again in 2009 for the first two phases, it got the highest sustainability rating uh, in the world. And we basically changed the way in which you do land development and uh, changed it from a very regulatory and top-down approach. Uh, also involved the community, the Vic West Neighborhood Association in the process as well. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the water system and also the energy system? So I think you're looking at renewable ways of reusing the treated wastewater and also uh, looking for a, a biofuel to energy system. Yes, so essentially we have two district systems on the site and those are really key to the sustainability and they are actually privately owned and operated. So the, the city of Victoria doesn't own them, doesn't maintain them, doesn't have to replace them. Other taxpayers don't have to pay for them um, and uh, they are much cheaper uh, and, and a higher quality uh, than uh, comparatively in the region. So uh, we have a district heat and hot water system and it is run initially on biomass um, and which is wood waste and it supplies heat to the whole uh, 15 acre, will supply heat to the whole 15 acre site when it's fully uh, developed. I've kept records of the heat and hot water because I owned a condo there from 2009 to uh, just a few months ago and uh, my heat and hot water costs were 20% of what conventional uh, charges are. So not only is it uh, environmentally better, it's also economically better. The wastewater treatment plants uh, reuses 80% of the water on site and it brings up the wastewater to almost Canadian drinking water standards. When they opened the site, they were, developers are actually drinking the water. Uh, it just exceeds the salinity standard. And um, another thing you'd be familiar with, John, as well, they had to go get an order in council from the provincial government because the regulations never thought that the uh, wastewater going into the upper harbor, the source uh, going into where it was, would be cleaner than the upper harbor water. So we actually had to get uh, an, an amendment, a uh, provincial amendment to allow us to do that. But the site design also reduces 80% of water use to start with and then reuses most of that on site, creating significant amenities like the water waves you can see here. Let me show you some other pictures of the waterway on the left up there is also one of the key amenities, uh, which is a rooftop garden, very, uh, very popular, allows local food production uh, a lot of socialization uh, on roofs that otherwise would be uh, bereft, derelict, never used. And, and so these are some of the things on the lower right there is the waterway and that is the jewel of the property, exceptionally well designed. Um, this is also, the, that street's changed a lot with the bike pathways, but looks at some of the commercial buildings. So it's a commercial and a residential uh, mix of development. Um, and then another picture of the waterway. Thanks very much, Kim. That shows you what a large scale development in Victoria can do to move the needle. I'd just like to say that from my own uh, knowledge that, that uh, these water, these condos that abut onto that waterway, which is a treated wastewater, are actually the most valuable. And the, those with the views of the harbour, which were thought to be the most valuable, have now been overtaken by those on the ground floor who were next to this uh, created waterway. So I want to move on to our next guest, my friend uh, Jean Miller, who is looking at much smaller scale uh, sustainability uh, planning in the Greater Victoria area. Jean uh, was uh, an entrepreneur who ran the Gaining Gown conferences in the first decade of the 2000s. They were extremely valuable conferences, but brought innovators from around the world to look at creative solutions for sustainable development and carbon neutrality in big city planning. But Gene is also a consultant to developers who is practicing what he preaches by developing a, a, a type of housing he calls ASH, which is affordable, sustainable housing. So Gene, can you tell us a little bit more about what ASH does and how it's new and what's its market? Uh, as best I can, I'm, I'm a worse interview subject than I am simply a conversationalist. 
Uh, and uh, I want to mention first that ASH actually stands for Affordable Sustainable Homes, not housing. And uh, uh, also to reflect, since you mentioned the Gaining Ground conferences, uh, that uh, you know you were an, a very active uh, author in conference design uh, and a very active participant. Uh, and we did that what fifteen years ago. Correct. Yes. And look, the whole world has changed. I, I say that with a certain amount of irony. Yes, but how are you making it? Change? <laughs> uh, the the idea, the Ash idea. Uh, uh, borrows, which is a nice word for steals, from something that we see all over town in Victoria, and uh, that is a houseplex. Houseplex being another word uh, for uh, a, a suited or converted um, uh, to suites uh, older home. And uh, so houseplexes are really the inspiration for Ash, and it is uh, as much as possible uh, a dwelling that uh, looks and behaves uh, like a, a typical single family or neighborhood home, uh, but is intention uh, by intention and from its moment of creation, uh, suited uh, on three levels um, and probably uh, the most unique feature about this houseplex, uh, since we're starting fresh, is that every unit has its own front door. Uh, the units are generally on the small side, uh, probably uh, best designed uh, to accommodate uh, singles, couples, maybe small families. Uh, the units can be a mix of suite sizes and, and bedroom configurations. Um, and uh, they can, uh, uh, under ideal circumstances, go anywhere uh, without creating the... the uh, the kind of visual uh, intervention that I think a, a, a lot of people in established neighborhoods uh, hate about redevelopment. So uh, Ash is mindful of all of that. Uh, and uh, it can be uh, offered either on a rental basis or a purchase basis at uh, a, a very nice price. Uh, one of the features of Ash is that uh, it tries to minimize parking but every ash uh, dwell, uh, development will come with uh, a share car to and, and uh, extensive bicycle storage and maintenance facilities. So it seems to me that it, it does two things. One is it provides an alternative for densification. So instead of the box condos, provides some kind of uh, single dwelling on a similar footprint, which is more amenable and dissolves the NIMBY syndrome. But it also meets the idea of people living within 15 minutes of a service center so they can get there either by bike or by walking or by a shared car. So we are contributing to carbon neutrality by the design and, and development of this. So are you confident that this is a kind of future of the market that you see more of these kinds of developments taking place in Victoria and maybe elsewhere? I, I uh, think that people are going to have to dedicate diminishing financial resources to meeting their housing needs. Uh, it just seems to me that that's the way the world is going these days. Uh, and uh, to, 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 that, to the extent that that is true, ASH is intended to, to uh, anticipate or meet uh, the uh, uh, diminished financial capacity that people may have to, uh, to provide their own shelter. Uh, in other words, the prices are real cheap. Yeah, well, hopefully it will allow some of the younger people to get into the housing market. But it's anyway, great. thanks very much, Gene, for the, your insights. I'm going to pass this back to Francis, who's going to talk a bit about some other housing innovations. You're welcome. Thank you, Gene. Thank you, Jonathan. And thank you, Kim. So have you ever wondered what it would take to build a house where energy be energy bills become a thing of the past. How about the quietest home ever or the least toxic? Or how about a house that's fireproof, pestproof, moldproof, and has more than a hundred year lifespan and is carbon neutral? On Creatively United's YouTube channel, you can find a documentary we created about the first house of its kind in the world built right here on the west coast of Vancouver Island. 
Where the average carbon footprint per individual is 15.12 tons per year, the owners of this house, Linda and Arno Kennanen, is less than half a ton or 15 times less the average. Arno comes from a Finnish family of pioneers. His own father, a civil engineer, warned of climate change in the 1970s. And Arno saw firsthand in his 30 year career as a naval architect, the alarming disappearance of Arctic ice of which nearly 40% of the volume of the polar ice pack had vanished during his career alone. The impact of what he saw led him on a mission to lead by example and reduce his carbon footprint and divest of oil in all areas of his and his wife Linda's life. He loves to show others how they too can lower, lower their eco footprint and costs while producing their own energy, food and water. Named the harmless home, the Kennanen's carbon neutral East Souk home was built for almost the same price of a conventionally constructed home. It uses revolutionary Canadian made hemp and limecrete Lego block like technology made in a carbon neutral Alberta factory where carbon sequestration begins in the fields of those farmers who grow the hemp. Arno suggests the fastest way to, ch to change is to lead by example and to provide a proven solution that is cheaper and better by being safer, healthier, longer lasting, earth resource conserving and less toxic. He cites Elon Musk of Tesla as an example of someone who has introduced new and improved solutions. Arno believes that new solutions not only need to be much better than the norm, but they need to be undeniably proven through research and documentation at every level, which is the ongoing process the Kennanens have been undertaking since day one with their home. It's a living laboratory for researchers of every description. As we have seen time and time again, big industry and government institutions only take small steps. Arno cites step code rules in constructions as an example. Arno urges that we make passive home construction the norm versus the exception. He says today's building codes don't target improvements more than one small step at a time, resulting in toxic moldy homes and expanded landfills. While disruptive technologies such as passive homes and his harmless home show that solutions exist that are actually cheaper to build and live in, less toxic, quieter, are more comfortable and sustainable throughout their lifetime. And the cost savings are significant. By staying with the status quo, Arno feels we are committing our society and individual families to subsidizing exactly what we should be eliminating as soon as possible. Today's construction practices continue to waste massive amounts of operational energy, resulting in toxic homes, expensive mold and leak repairs, and short lifetimes, especially those homes using chipboard construction. Arno is confident new and significantly better solutions will soon force big industry to wake up and change direction because the ones who don't will become irrelevant and disappear. We see it all the time. So thanks to individuals like Arno for leading by example and creating solutions for us all to embrace. Now, it's time for question and answer. We do have uh, a few minutes to do that and I'm just gonna jump in. So let's have a look. So I'm going to ask our panelists and I invite any of you to jump on in. This one's from an anonymous attendee who says, my family has very little waste and we don't buy very much in hard crinkle and black plastics. We see so much in the market, the meat, the produce, the interior aisles have lots of the above. Do you see food markets going towards less of the above packaging? I find that if the consumers want something, if enough of them say they want brown paper packaging, they will get it. There are individual grocery and butcher stores that I go to that will provide bulk or frozen things. They're in Vancouver, where I live, um, unceded traditional territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh. They have um, nada, which you, we can get some frozen sausages that are in um, reused packaging. There are a number of butchers which wrap everything in brown paper, which is compostable. So it means more time going to those other stores, those small stores, but it's possible. And I think the more we tell Whole Foods and Choices and Safeway and IGA that that's what we want, I think there's enough of a groundswell, it'll happen. I mean, they did this 50 years ago. Why can't they do it now? Thank you, Fiona. 
Another question, I hope you will list some concrete actions that you wish the CRD to take during this webinar. Any of our panelists want to jump into some concrete actions that the CRD could take? Well, first, you've been talking a lot about food waste and um, you know the, the amount of food waste that we, we create. So it's quite easy to reduce that amount of food waste. And since we have an organic ban in the CRD, it's inconceivable to me why we can still allow one fifth of all of the waste to be organic waste. So I think as a priority, we should be shifting, A, should be reducing the amount of food waste we create collectively. And secondly, within 10 years, we should re remove any additional food waste going into the landfill so that it's all composted off site. The second thing is, I think that uh, Larry Gardner is onto something with his uh, way of establishing discount fees to encourage waste haulers to divert before they go to the landfill. So effectively they're incented to find recycling solutions rather than, than pay tipping fees. And, and finally, I think the whole concept of tipping fees, i.e. that you pay as you tip is an anachronism with a zero waste future. If you've got zero waste, you have zero fees. So we need to rethink the business model of landfills so that it doesn't encourage tipping, it discourages tipping, and it, it creates the kind of future that we want to see around Mount Work. Okay, I'm going to move on to the next question. COVID has eliminated the opportunity to use our own packaging and our bags. How can we address that if COVID is going to be with us for the next year or two? Well, I, I can jump in and answer that question. I can say that um, farmers markets are just the best. And I come home from the farmer's market with my bike pannier filled with produce and no bags, uh, very few, and maybe, a, maybe the odd bag, uh, but it's paper. And at that, don't even need it. So I would say if you can shop local as much as possible and the zero waste store on Douglas Street, and I know there's zero waste stores in other communities, they've been working around this. And if you think that if any store was going to be highly affected by COVID, it would be like our zero waste, no packaging stores. And yet they've managed to work around it. So highly encourage you to check that out. Um, question here, was solar energy incorporated in Dockside Green? If not, could it have been? How much more economically attractive is it today uh, than it would have been when Dockside Green was in the planning stage? Kim, do you want to take that one? Sure. The uh, Yes, there was some uh, solar put in uh, Dockside Green. It wasn't extensive. Essentially, it's over the top of the commercial building, so full, the Fola B uh, bakery and the coffee shop. Uh, the commercial first commercial building also has it designed in the roof that you can install it. Um, but it's essentially, uh, a, a, it was too expensive, or I guess I said in terms of all of the renewables, all of the green technology that was put in, uh, the solar was on the lower end of it. When you have a district heat and hot water system and a wastewater system, um, and also uh, one of the keys within that is this, the passive solar. So there was passive solar design. So 90% of the living spaces have uh, natural light to them. That's the lead standard. And also some of the things that somewhat relate, it's also a very, very healthy place to live. Um, there is no smoking anywhere on the site, including you know, uh, buildings, low volatile organic compounds and the glues, paints, flooring. Uh, direct air straight in from the roof instead of down the hallways, which you get in conventional ones. So um, it's uh, it's just a much brighter, much healthier place, uh, apartments, apartment condominiums and townhouses to live in. So I, I think the solar mostly is passive, but there was a bit uh, and it has capacity for more. It's just when you get 63 out of a total of 70 points in the world uh, and you're the world leader, it just it, how much more could you do? Thank you. And one more question, Kim, that Shirley um, has asked here. Has there been any lead projects undertaken on Vancouver Island since Dockside Green? Yes, there's been individual projects, like individual buildings, but not a site uh, the size of Dockside Green. And that's uh, been disappointing because uh, essentially my second book, if I'm going to write it, is on the failure of local land use planning and municipal finance and development finance because they encourage uh, sprawl. Um, and and can, and keep you know minimize your uh, regulations 
that you have to change and that sort of thing. So it, it stops these types of development. They take an extraordinary amount of use, but uh, we are working with one development in uh, the regional district of Nanaimo that is proposing for the first time ever to uh, reuse gray water as potable water. So Island Health is supporting that and they will use or treat all the sewage on their property. So that's of the same size. So we are working on that. Thank you. And Ken asks, how much waste entering land he feels is from construction and renovation and how can it be reduced? And that'll probably be our last question and then we'll have to get to the others on our, um, on our video replay. The phrase is, so from what I understand from the solid waste plan and the CID that um, demolition waste is a big factor in the amount of waste going into the landfill. So one of the keys is to look at deconstruction and how we can salvage as much from buildings that have been brought down rather than simply wrapping them all up and sticking them into the landfill. So again, a more imaginative tipping fee regime where you're not getting paid to get rid of all that stuff, but you're getting paid to divert it is a much better solution than we've got today. Thank you so much, John. Thank you to all our panelists. Solutions exist. Now we can all move the dial forward with action. So if you're not sure where to start, I suggest you maybe check out our 58 solutions for lighter and healthy living on creativelyunited.org. We have a resource section, we have events, information, and everything there to help guide your journey. And stay tuned because our next webinar on Wednesday, February 10th, will feature a number of incredibly talented and well-established visual artists, including Roy Henry Vickers and Roberta Pick Sutherland for an insightful look beyond the obvious. Thank you for your questions. And as I mentioned, we will post the answers to your questions that didn't get answered today on our video replay and check out creativelyunited.org. Thanks for joining us. See you next month. Thanks to everyone. Bye for now.